Hello there. So this video, I want to talk about, do I need to create one style of art? <clears throat> it's a great topic. Um, and it's one of the things that I've seen coming up most in the comments and the questions during your Art Matters week. So that's what I want to delve into in today's session. There are some other questions that have been sent in as well that I want to answer, but this is going to be the big topic that we cover. Um, so before I delve in, and whilst I wait for people to hop on live, I just want to read a, a poem that was sent from Victoria. It was so lovely. Um, so this was just sent in this morning. Your Art Matters Week has been so much fun. And for many, the art journey may have just begun. Seeing all the variety and styles, making people have really big smiles. Team UAS and YAM are really nice. The teams are fantastic for our advice. I can't wait to grow more and more. So there's so much art, I can't carry it through the door. <laughs> so this poem is to say thank you for helping me grow my artistic view. Things have only just begun, so thank you. Uh, Team UAS and Michelle, and hope the future goes really well. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Victoria, that's lovely. Um, and then there was another... <coughs> There's been so many comments sent in, but I just saw these ones this morning. Um, what I love, Francis just sent me a message saying, um, what, where is it? Like, where is it gone? Um, I love this. So, I love listening to you and your passion for creating is truly inspiring. I had a mad walk into a gallery in Birmingham after school on Wednesday after a lovely class of inner city year six children got chatting and the chap is going to stock some of my prints. I would never have even known to do that until listening to your podcasts while gardening for a client on Mondays. I know my experience is one of many. So your creativity is growing through all of us. Oh, <laughs> as only creativity can um that's made my day thank you so much that was so lovely um so yeah there's the there's the your art matters podcast of course uh where you can go and tune in um so it was really nice to hear that that has had, a, had an impact and that now somebody's got their artwork in a gallery um so it's lovely lovely to hear so let's delve in let's delve into this this topic around do I need one style of art because some of the questions and um, statements being made let me just read one here so this was from Rebecca so Rebecca says this is what I struggle with most I have so many styles because I love creating many styles but I keep hearing it's best to commit to one style this causes confusion and paralysis and I just she's gone on to say, I just want to keep, move forward creating what I love and see what happens. Um, and then I saw there was a lot of other people as well saying the same thing that just saying, I feel sometimes just blocked because I just feel like I'm supposed to have this style. I'm supposed to have this and I don't know what to focus on. I don't want to focus because I like doing it all. And that then just seems to block me when I have to focus. So <laughs> let's let's delve into this. So I think the first thing to realize in the art making process is you can make art your way in any way that you want to. So it goes back to the other day around the judgment and the the opinions of others that we hear and it starts to derail us. And when you know that inside of you, you can make whatever you like, it's your, it's your decision, it's your art. You make art your way how you want it. You don't have to fit the mold of anybody. Um, and so when you acknowledge that, it's very liberating because Remember that that is inside of you. You can control that. You have that decision. You can make any art that you like. <laughs> um, and if you want to just, you know, get out of bed and make the art that you want to make that day, then do it. You know, no one is stopping you. That's absolutely fine. Um, and so knowing that and just accepting that sometimes 
I, I know this sounds really simple and some people might think, well, <laughs> this is really basic advice. But sometimes just remembering that when you when you're going about your art making, just going like, you know, I am the captain of my own ship here. <laughs> I can make art my own way. This is my life. You know, I can do it however I like. Thank you. <laughs> Ryan in our in our community today put a funny post out saying, I usually dress really conservatively. But it just suddenly dawned on me, I'm an artist, so actually I can dress however I like. <laughs> and I really love that because, um, you know, it goes back to that same realisation that I'm an artist. Yeah, uh, your rules don't apply. I can't remember who used that quote. It's not one of mine. Uh, but I love that. I'm an artist. Your rules don't apply. Um, and so I think as as a creative yeah, you can dress how you like. You can make the art that you like. That's the part of being an artist that's quite exciting. And we have we can make our own rules. You can do whatever you please. <laughs> when you when you accept that and and own that, it's like hmm. Um. So where the confusion comes from is when you want to put your art out into the world. And if you want it to be seen and engaged by others on some level, or if you want to sell it, or you want it to get in front of people to make them happy or to make an impact in some way, then this is where this confusion starts to come from. This is where then you'll start to hear around the, con the, the consistency in the work. So this is where it becomes a bit elusive. So let me let me try and explain. So I don't think it's about having a style. It's not about having one style because, well, there are many artists out there that have, you know, it, it's style. Again, it depends on your definition of the word style and what you how, how you describe that but that can be the thing that really starts to limit people when they're thinking that I need one style because then people start to think that I need to create art in the same colors or the same subject matter or it has to be the same way over and over and over again and that's not what it is so I tend not to use the word style what it what it is more about if this is what you want if you want to push your work out into the world. It's about having some consistency in the delivery of your artwork. So the consistency doesn't have to be the subject matter. It doesn't have to be the materials that you use. It doesn't have to be those things. But when you start to fine tune your voice as an artist, and this is what we teach. We'll, we, we teach inside our platforms, in the, inside the hub and the virtual art studio. You know, this is about you learning what to select and shelve. So you're selecting parts of your art making that you think, oh, yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is good. I'm going to do more of this. What starts to happen when you learn what to select from your art making process is that you'll start to develop your own voice, your own, I like to think of it as your flavor <laughs> rather than a style. It's your flavor, your voice coming through. You'll see it in certain artists where you'll see that their art making, it has, it has their personality coming through. Maybe there's some some kind of consistency in the work where you can tell it came from that artist. That's what's happening when you start to develop your voice, which gets confused with having a style. So it's not necessarily, Anish Kapoor is a great example. Anish Kapoor is a sculptor. He's a British sculptor. And he is known for making very, very large scale Sculpt, sculpt, sculptures <laughs> that you know you probably know him for that the, the big mirrored um 
I, I, it's like a big organic shape that you can walk through. Where is it? Oh my gosh, I can't even remember where it is. Is it in America, that one? Um, and he he plays with materials that really get you to question, like how on earth did he create that piece? And it's kind of interactive as well. And I remember going to one of his shows in a gallery and it was in the Royal Academy in London and he'd made like these big wax sculptures and the Royal Academy is all white walls, pristine, very, very old building that feels regal, royal, uh, special. It's really ornate and, you know, it feels like, well, that's where they, you know, centuries ago, the Academy and held their classes there and that's where you went if you wanted to be a real artist and you know so it has this kind of feel and he took over the gallery and uh, had big massive cannons spraying the walls with red wax it was insane uh, and it was to make you feel uncomfortable because you're in this building with all these white walls where there's usually ornate frames and and he just splattered wax everywhere it was bonkers but that's you know, that's his voice. So he doesn't use, he doesn't carry on using red wax all the time. That was for that show. But the the theme in his work and the, the voice comes from him exploring, um, you know, our perception, making us feel uncomfortable, questioning and doing things in large scale. So if we were to commission Anish Kapoor, which would cost an absolute fortune, <laughs> um, we know that, he, you know, he's not going to come back with something tiny and minuscule. He we know, we know, we know what to expect. He's got some consistency in, in what he's creating where we go. Okay. So he, we know, um, and this is why galleries tend to prefer to represent people with consistency in their work. That's what they're looking for. They're not doing it to be awkward, is, <laughs> which I know it can feel like that, or they're not trying to do it to control you. It's a gallery will represent you because they know they have a client base that would buy the type of work that you're creating. So they know that they can sell that type of work. Now, if you are an artist that then just goes off and says, well, I'm not creating that artwork anymore, I'm creating this artwork, they can't sell that anymore. <laughs> And that's where why the galleries are looking for that consistency so that they know that when they sell all of your work, you're going to be able to replace it with the same kind of work. Yes, there'll be an evolution. Your work will change. It's not just going to stay stagnant. It should never stay stagnant. But they're looking for those consistencies. Now, if I can, if I can try and explain it in another way, um, I went to I went to this pop divas theater thing yesterday with my daughter. She's eight, and there was a school organized this trip to this pop diva thing at the theater, and um, and it was uh, four girls on the stage doing three hits from people like <laughs> I'm gonna try and remember now Katy Perry. Um, Little Mix, um, loads of kind of iconic people for, for that age group. <laughs> and, um, but it's interesting because when I was sitting there listening, you know, they've all got their own flavor, all of these artists, although it was all kind of pop and this genre, you, when you hear all the, the three different types of songs had consistency so each artist they were representing was very different. But within that, so let me give you an example. So um, there was, oh, is it, I, I'm going to probably get this name wrong now. <laughs> is it Billie Eilish? I don't know if you know Billie Eilish because I didn't until yesterday. So Billie Eilish is a singer and her music is quite dark. The lyrics are quite dark, and there's a there's a there's a a deep bass line. You know, 
that comes through in all of her songs. There's this dark bit of a dark bass, deep bass. Um, and then when they performed Katy Perry, for example, there's a completely different feel. Um, there's like an energy and it's like, oh, my fine, <laughs> you know, her voice, she has these... Um, the way she uses her voice, it came through in all the songs. You could recognize that it. it was a Katy Perry song. And so when you buy their album, you know what you're going to get. You know that you're going to get that type of music because if I don't like um, the Billie Eilish type of music, then, you know, if I want to buy an album from someone and then there's that type of music, I'd be like, oh, I don't like that. And so this is where having some consistency when you when you want to put your work out into the world comes in very very handy <laughs> because it starts to speak to people and people know what to expect so for example my good friend Sharon can't do a live without mentioning Sharon she's just been given a commission this year which is worth 10,000 pounds probably a bit more than 10,000 pounds and the commission is to create a series of sculptures now, they are giving Sharon £10,000 because they know what they're going to get back. They know Sharon's voice. They know that they're going to get a sculpture in the kind of look and feel to what she's creating. They know that if Sharon was painting a frog and then the next week painting the landscape and then creating a figure based on something and you know if if the work was all over the place they wouldn't give her ten thousand pounds because they would be very nervous of what was going to come back like I have no clue um so that's where rather than thinking about having a style it's about having it's about finding your flavor having some consistency what some parts that you're saying yes to and some parts that you're saying no to that starts to develop your own unique voice so you can create in different materials. Another great example is an artist called Amanda Oleander. And Amanda is mainly known for her illustrative work. And she will she'll draw and she has consistency in the way she executes her drawings so for her it's in her mark making the way she creates her marks it's kind of her signature look you can tell Amanda's drawing straight away and then although she creates in completely different subject matter so she will literally just create uh I love her because she'll just create today I'm this is me shaving my legs <laughs> and she'll do a quick drawing of her day and then another day, it'll be like, this was me with my partner choosing furniture, and she'll she'll draw that. And so she's drawing all the time different things. But when you see her work, there's, there's subtle consistencies there that really shout that that is her work. Then if we were to commission Amanda, then we'd know that that's the type of art that we would get back. But she's also got another side of her art making, which is her paintings, which look completely different. They are completely different. They, they almost probably do look like they came from a different artist. Um, but within her paintings, there's also this consistency. Again, they're not completely random. They're, there's something there that pulls them together, but they're very different from her drawings. So... In all of this, it's about, I think, going back again to the beginning of you just deciding what you want for your art. And you don't have to do it any way <laughs> that anyone else does. It's really important that you find your way, you find your own voice. There are many ways of making art. Some people like to make the same art all the time. Some people like that, some people don't. And if you don't, there is still a way of making art where you develop your voice and fine tune your voice without having to commit to making the same art all the time. You don't have to do that. There is still ways that you can learn how to 
ask yourself the right questions, fine tune that voice like you're fine tuning an instrument so that you've got consistency through your work. Um, and that's what we teach. That's what we're going to be doing in, inside the virtual art studio through, through the art challenges and through you learning how to select parts of your art making and leave parts so that you're not trying to do everything at the same time. And then you start to notice these patterns emerging and this voice evolving. You'll learn more about yourself and your art and it educates you as well. So there is lots and lots of benefits from learning how to have that consistency. So don't think about having one style. It's not about that at all. It's not about forcing one style. Tracy Law, who's one of my members, was talking to me about this last week when we did a studio session together. Um, and when Tracy joined us, she, well, she says this herself. She said, I didn't have a voice. I was making all types of art, didn't really know why I was making, just wanted to make it, you know, like all of us, just, just enjoy making, just enjoy exploring and playing with all these different ideas and different materials. And you see something there and I'm just going to draw it. And, you know, that part of us, we should never let go of. It's really important. But for Tracy, she said, what's been amazing about joining our community is now she's starting to really learn the right questions to ask herself and learning how to fine tune her voice, which she never thought she wanted to do. But what she realized is she does have art inside of her that has this consistency and she realized that she's been blocking it and she's now been creating this kind of series of work based on caricature, cartoon, um, illustrate, illustrative humor. And she's delving into this and learning so much about herself. And she said, I've realized that, you know, I still do like all the painting and things like that, but this is my voice. This is really at the core of what makes me, me. And that's what she started to tap into. This is the bit that I find really exciting when you start to fine tune. You realize that, oh my gosh, there's a part of me in here that I've not released. As an artist, I do have parts of me that want to come out in a, in a series of work. It's still important, though, that you play and experiment. So even when you do find those consistencies, so let's take Tracy as an example. Tracy has found now this side of her that's humorous and she's creating these kind of uh, funny illustrations of people and and that that's pouring out of her now. She's loving it. But 20%, I always talk about the 80-20 rule. It's obviously just a, a generalization. You don't have to split it 80-20, but 20% of your art making and especially for Tracy, should still be doing the things that aren't drawing, turning it on its head, doing things in different colors, using different materials, creating a, a frog drawing because you feel like it. Because in that part of play and experimenting and, and doing things in different ways, it evolves your work. Your work should evolve. <laughs> Shouldn't just stay the same, but then again, it, it can. <laughs> That's just my view. Um, I believe that you know, when we go on this journey of art making, it, it the beauty comes from the evolution of trying something else and then you put that into the work and then it becomes something else. So every time you're making, it's moving and changing and evolving, sometimes pivoting, sometimes completely changing. As you learn more about yourself and what you want to communicate, you might go, God, I don't want to do that anymore. This is, this is the artwork I want to make. So, yeah, like some, yeah, Sonal says here, I always think I have to stick to one style and then I get bored, but you shouldn't be bored as an artist. You know, if you're bored, then there's something wrong. You should never, you should feel excited. That's, that's why we've created the virtual art studio. We want to help you get excited about your art. You should not feel bored because it's not about sticking to one style. It's about finding something inside of yourself that fires you up, that lights you up. If your art making is getting boring, then it's you haven't tapped into what's in here. Um, you haven't fired up the cylinders that are like, whoa, this is exciting, this medium or this subject matter. And um, I remember Sharon scared about sticking to the figure for a while. 
because she was creating all these different types of things. And she she said, I'm going to focus on the figure for a while. It really frightens me because I like doing my trees and I like doing my birds. But she focused, but she played. She still spent that time playing, but she focused on the figure. And it's. she said, I can't believe how exciting it is <laughs> to focus. And she said, and I'm unraveling all this um, all these connections with the figure and my childhood and I'm learning all these different materials to explain how I, you know, when she's, she's now exploring all these different materials of how she can depict the figure, she says it's, it's really exciting. As soon as she starts to feel like, oh, this is getting boring now, she goes back to playtime, <laughs> going back to, going back inwards and going, what is it that I'm curious about? What is it that can feed into this art to spark, to spark it again. And it's a cycle as well, which is what we'll teach you inside the virtual art studio. It's a cycle. So the, the artist journey is you start and you've got no ideas and you're flat and you don't know what to do. So you gather, you gather, you mind map, you gather your inspiration, you gather some images, you create a starting point for yourself, you get yourself excited you connect with what it is that's in here that fires you up. And then you pull all that together. You have a starting point, you go and play <laughs> and it goes full circle to like sieving. We start to sieve, sieve the art making so that you start to fine tune the voice. So, and then each time you repeat your art making, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So, yeah, you, if it's normal to feel boredom and to feel flat sometimes in your art making, but that's the trigger of, right, you need to fire it back up again. There's something you're not tapping into what's in here if you're feeling like that. Um, so, oh, David, hello. David says, I'm feeling inspired at the moment. Good. <laughs> so remembering all of this, it's, it's about you choosing, you choosing, you being the captain of your own art ship, you deciding what you want to do. Um, and if you do feel that you want to fine tune that voice, that's where we can help you in the virtual art studio. That's the platform we've created to help you start to learn the right questions to ask yourself, to start to select and shelve and to start to play but play with intention playing with noticing noticing your voice emerging that's what we want to teach you inside there we want to help you start to see that oh, this is part of my art making look at this you can start to see this is my work and it should feel exciting when we don't want to shackle you down and it's the opposite we want to unleash that part of you um so for those joining the virtual art studio, I'm very excited to be working with you. Let me know in the comments if you're joining us. Um, for now, though, I want to turn to other questions that have been sent in. So there's some of the questions here. And please, those watching live, um, feel free to add your views on the questions as well, because I think that it's great. We've got an amazing community here from around the world, so we can all give our input because everyone's view is different and it's always nice to hear different opinions from each other. So um let me let me go to the questions so my natural voice is to make big abstract bold and textured pieces they sound nice <laughs> mm. this is a good question okay so my natural voice is to make big abstract bold textured pieces but I really want to learn how to draw faces, but I can't seem to reconcile the two. So this is a great question. And what I would say is don't try and reconcile them. <laughs> Just don't. Just make them. You know, they don't have to be reconciled. Just continue with the bold textured pieces if you feel that that is your natural voice. It's really normal for us to... Um, let me just try, I'm just trying to think of an example here for me. So, so yeah, for me, for example, my, let's say my natural voice, like you've just described, and I don't know who this came from. I didn't write the name down. Sorry. Um, is 
you know, I'm organic. I'm organic. I like wibbly wobbly things. I, I like to draw my other hand. I like to, I'm loose. I like the fig, I like bringing the figure and the landscape together. Now this is, this is evolved by the way, you know, years ago, it wasn't that this is where I'm at right now. Um, and that feels like my natural voice at the moment. It feels like that's what I'm really excited about. It's something that I want to explore. That has come from select uh, delve and shelve, shall we say. Um, delving and shelving is where you're starting to select parts of your art making and you park some of them for now so that you can start to fine tune your voice. And so that feels like the natural progression for me at the moment. But then there's parts of me that wants to just draw the frog. And then I just want to explore the other thing. That That's the playtime. So the faces for you is your, your playtime. I'm being drawn to faces right now. So just do them. Just draw them, paint them. Um, and don't try and force them to come together right now. Because what you might find is they might come together or they might not. It might just be something that you have to get out of your system. You might, I've, I've come across this a lot where you'll suddenly have this surge to draw faces and you'll do it for six or eight weeks and then you've done it and you go, oh, I'm done with that now. <laughs> Sometimes you've just, you're in a moment where you're curious about something and you get it out of your system and it's gone. Or, for example, you might start to explore faces and play around with faces and then that might start to incorporate into the natural voice of the abstract and texture pieces organically. Don't force it. When you start to so say um, Fridays, I'm, I'm drawing my faces, I'm doing faces. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, I'm doing my abstract work, doing the faces here, abstract work here. And then what might start to happen is all of a sudden when you're going back to the abstract pieces, you might start to see faces appear. <laughs> because the work that you're doing over here is starting to, this is the voice, it's your flavor, your mark making, your subconscious is recording all the marks you're making, it's recording how you're feeling when you're creating something. It's storing this artistic muscle that you have. So then when you come to do your texture pieces, it will start to come through. If it's important to you, it will, it will start to come. Um, what happened to me, I remember when I was creating the figure and then I was creating the landscape, I remember looking at my board and I had all these pictures of the figure and then all these pictures of mountains. And I just thought, these just don't go together. Like, you're probably feeling the faces and the arms. They just don't go together. Um, so I, I didn't force them together. I just kept playing with both of them separately. Like, this is me playing with the figure. And then I was creating some organic leaf shapes and mountains. And, and I just just kept playing independently and then what happened is they did come together they are right now so what's happening is I am now creating the figure and the mountain where you can't tell whether it's the landscape or whether it's the figure like they could be either that's come from me developing and playing this is where you start to create this uniqueness in your work this is what makes you stand out from the crowd and to any other artists it, it comes over over time from playing and selecting and rejecting ideas. And now I've got kind of this unique, these new unique ideas forming. So um, I wouldn't force anything. Don't try and force things, let things organically come. When you play um, and you start to select, it's, it's really, this is part of the art making process is learning what to select and what to reject. We, we now use the term delve and shelf <laughs> because reject feels a bit final like you're rejecting this and you'll never be able to do it again it's not about that it's just parking things for a while so that you can hone in on this and go right okay what, what am I going to do with this with this idea that's really exciting um so let me go to the next question from Lucia I have so many days where I feel this stage won't change. How do you constantly overcome the anxiety of feeling like you'll never understand the world of art? This is a good question. <sighs> this is one of the questions actually that's going to be answered in the book <laughs> that I'm writing. But um, 
So I, I don't know if I've taken your question out of context a little bit, but this first part of I have so many days where I feel this stage won't change. I'm assuming you mean that in terms of your your kind of art making. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I feel that it, you're maybe referring to this as this stage won't change. So maybe you're creating art at the moment and it feels that it's not, the place where you want it to be maybe it's not the caliber that you want it to be or it might just not feel right it might just be the art that doesn't feel like you and that might be this you just can't imagine the stage changing um so let me answer your question in these two parts so for for that part of the question i just as hard as it is you have to trust the process so and I, I use those words all the time, trust the process, trust the process. When I think that things aren't, aren't moving or things are maybe going wrong, <laughs> trust the process, trust the process. Um, but in your art making, it will change. It will change it because especially when you're, when you're approaching your art through what we're teaching here around being really mindful of what you're making and choosing what you want and getting really excited about your artwork and then deciding where you want to take it. It will change. It has to. It will change. So trust that process. It will evolve. Where you are today is not where you'll be in a week, a month, six months or a year. So if it's in terms of the skill gap, which sometimes we all have, well, I think we always have a skill gap because if you want to improve, there's always a, a gap, isn't there? Um, you know, for me, my art, there's a, I can see a massive skill gap. <laughs> but when I compare now to where I was two years ago, after going back to art after a big long break, I've definitely improved, definitely. Still not where I want to be, but it's improved. So you have to take moments to acknowledge those times of progress it's really important to stop sometimes and just look back like I am changing this is moving I am getting better um if it's at the stage of things not changing in terms of I'm trying to think of some other examples so if it, that that's kind of like the artwork not being where you want it to be if it's more just you're, maybe you're feeling stuck in a rut. Um, then for me, I, I look at other people that have got out of ruts, you know, inspire yourself with other people's stories that anything can change. For example, we've had people in our community. I remember uh, Chris joining years ago and she was creating paintings and she wanted to focus on cats for a while and I remember she focused on cats and she she created a painting which was lovely by the way it was lovely it was it was really flat so it had no depth but it had loads of character it was, it was a really nice cheeky painting but she wasn't happy with it because she wanted it to look more three-dimensional she wanted the to be depth um, and that was important to her, not to fit anyone else's opinions. You know, she could have carried on making the art that the, the other way, but she wanted to have more depth and have this more realistic interpretation in her artwork. And I'm not kidding, within a year, oh my gosh, the transformation in a year, I don't think it was even quite a year, from literally just honing and focusing and going, this is what I want to, this is where I want to take my art and this is what I'm going to focus on. Her cat portrait in the end was, at, it was just like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But both were, you know, both were fantastic. But it was, it was for me, the transformation from one, from one voice to another or style or whatever you want to call it was incredibly drastic. And it you could so, you know, stories like that remind you that wherever your art is now is not going. It will be different in a year. It will. Part of it is deciding what where you want to go and what you want to do, and the other part is learning the right questions to ask yourself to get there. <laughs> 
Now, the other part of your question, how do you overcome the anxiety and feeling that you'll never understand the art world? Here is my view. Don't try and understand the art world. Just don't. Because the art world is massive. The art world is huge. And the way to see the art world is millions and billions of pockets. Um, there was a great guy called Paul Klein who described the art world years ago as lots of little villages, lots of little villages. And just like the world is, you know, we have lots of countries and then lots of, you know, if we try to understand the whole world and the geography, it's mind bending. And it's, it's the same for the art world. There are so many different pockets. There are there are art worlds that are focused on oils and art worlds that are focused on the figure and art worlds that are focused on collage and artworks. You know, the, there are so many pockets. And the best thing you can do is create your own art world. We are living in a world right now where we can create our own worlds. It's really powerful and very, very exciting because years ago, you had to fit into an art village. You had to fit into these places. There was no other way to be an artist because they controlled the galleries. They, I'm talking about the academy and the, the galleries. You had to get into a gallery for your work to be seen. Um, it's not like that anymore. We don't have to fit in to those places you can create your own art world that's what we teach people to do people are creating their own worlds <laughs> so exciting you create your art your way find your people you start to create your own world um you start to find your own people really easily on social media so and not just even social media there are so many ways now i think um to do this offline as well. It's something that I'm exploring um, more and more. You know, we don't ha we don't have to just rely on social media. There's this perception that we do, but we don't. So that's what that's my advice. I wouldn't try to understand the world of art unless you want to, unless you want to go and you know <laughs> study art history and delve into all the the world and. Um, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to understand it. If you just remember that the art world is full of different pockets, there are some pockets where art is really, really expensive and it has to be like this to be in this place. There are other parts, villages, where art can be free and it's this price. There's loads of different different places. <laughs> um, Oh, this is a good one from Ginny. How do you know when to stop on a piece of artwork? I'm probably not the best person to answer this one. <laughs> Can anyone in the in the comments now watching give us some tips? So knowing when to stop. Well, for me, uh, there's a few tips I can give on this one. I think, one, if you're getting really stuck on a piece and you don't know whether it's finished... The biggest tip I can give is just stop and walk away from it and just give it some space. Um, so what I tend to do with my pieces, um, I will stop and I'll actually put it up on a wall and I'll live with it for a little while and I'll just keep looking at it and mm, contemplating it and thinking it could do with a little bit more there or here. Uh, maybe go to another piece and start working on something else, but give it some space before you completely decide or before you overwork it, maybe. Um, the other thing is you can ask other people. It's kind of dangerous doing that sometimes because you'll get lots of different opinions because art is subjective. People will think it's finished. Some people will think it's not. Every single person will have a different view, <laughs> but it can be helpful because you might just get someone say, do you know what, maybe it just needs something in this top corner to just take the eye out of the canvas. And you go, oh, now that's it. Um, and there might be lots of advice that you think, no. Um, so that, that could be something else that you do. Um, it could just be one small little piece that just needs adding that just, wow, transforms it. Um, the other thing I would say 
on this, knowing whether a piece is finished or not, is it comes with practice. It really does. The more you, again, it comes back to knowing the right questions to ask yourself. When you learn more about visual language and what you want the viewer to feel in your artwork, you will start to intuitively know when a piece is finished. It really does come with practice. There's those two things of knowing knowing what you want to say through your artwork and understanding visual language and how you use that, which is what we love teaching. So the visual language is the formal element. So it's how you use your composition. It's how you use colors together. It's how you use tone, contrast, those kinds of things, which are foundational elements that cut across all different genres. It doesn't matter what art you're making. Once you start to learn those and how to use them to depict what you want to say through your artwork and how you want other people to feel when they see your artwork, when you start to get more in tune with that, when you start to learn how to execute your work and you, you'll just feel it. You're like, oh my gosh, that's it. <laughs> It will just grow. So they're my three tips. Um... <laughs> I've just seen a comment from Ryan saying, I'm, I'm looking forward to a new lesson, how to dress like an artist with confidence. Because <laughs> all of my lessons are how to do this with confidence, how to do this with confidence. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Oh, this is a great one from Amber. A mentor once told me an artwork is never finished. It just stops in interesting places. That is such great advice. That is great advice. It's never finished. Yeah. It's it's beautiful actually. When you think when you think in that way, this goes back to what I've been saying about <laughs> creating your flavor as well, because that artwork is going to feed into your next artwork and the next artwork. So you're right, it's never finished. Your art, your art keeps feeding in and feeding into the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. Um, but that, that piece <laughs> in totality, um, it's interesting. There was Carol, oh, Carol, I think I've seen you on, Carol says um, the other day that she's got an artwork that's been going for 10 years. It's the same artwork. I love that idea of having an artwork that's been going for 10 years. Still not finished. It's really lovely when you start to hear all the different ways that people work that, yeah, you know, this, this idea of it has to be finished now, it has to be done. Maybe it can carry on for 10 years. <laughs> um, yeah. It all goes back to what, what you want, though. You know, art is subjective. and You could create a piece of artwork with a with just a dot in the corner. And I, I might say, oh, it feels like it needs something down here in the, in the right-hand corner to anchor it, you know. You might be like, no, because that, I want that space. The dot is representing the space and the it's a, it's a moment to pause, you know what you're trying to say might be different to what I'm trying to grapple with myself. Usually when people look at artwork, they're trying to put something in to make themselves <laughs> feel, feel better about the piece or, uh, which can be helpful sometimes, you know, it can be good to hear that, but equally it all goes back to what you want to say, what you want to say with your work. But knowing the, knowing though, how to use visual language and how, your art makes people feel is really important. That's why in the virtual art studio, we're going to start doing regular critique sessions. And I know they sound really scary, but it's about, it's not scary. It's about this conversation. It's about, okay, if you've put this dot here, what is that saying? Um, how is that making us feel and, and having conversations around what would happen if you put something here and helping you start to, to talk about your artwork so I'm excited to start doing those. We, we did them a while ago and we've, we've kind of stopped. So I'm looking forward to getting back up and running with those. Um, right, next question. And um, this is a big one today. Um, I'm usually only live for half an hour on a Monday. 
Uh, Betty says, uh, you've really hit a nerve with me. I'm making jewelry and I want to be more creative and use many mediums. But my big issue is my age. I'm 69 and I just don't think it would make any difference to the world. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Stop. <laughs> uh, oh, let me just stop for a minute. Okay, so I'm 69. And I just don't think I would make any difference to the world or I could make money, which I need to do. I fight depression. And right now I just want to think of what I want to do, but feel like there's too much holding me back. Oh, Betty, I just want to give you a big hug through the screen. Um, first of all, on the age thing, it really does not matter. It is never too late. This is one of my mantras. It's never too late to bring your creative passions alive. But it really is true because it doesn't matter what age or stage you are. Oh, let me share some examples really quickly. You know, we've had people, we've had people join our community later in life and they've, they've started to make art and get it out into the world within a few, within a few weeks. I remember Dr. Viv joining last year. Dr. Viv found us. She'd been making art for one week. Literally, she'd made art for one week. She hadn't made art in her life. And within, I think it was within six months, let's say. It was within a few months. I can't remember exactly. This one artwork, she had one artwork, one artwork, had won awards, it had gone traveling, <laughs> it had gone in exhibitions around the world. One artwork. And this is why I always say to people, you just need one artwork. Um, so that just shows you that in such a short space of time, you can do you can do so much. But like you say, it's, it's holding yourself back. So don't let the age thing. I remember Sylvan joining us and Sylvan won't mind me sharing this. Sylvan joined us, but I think she was like 78. And now she's in her 80s. I think she's 83 now. She's loving her art. She's she's doing a she's doing a TikTok course, learning how to do video. Sylvan joined us. I remember her describing herself as being this person who'd been locked in a cave all of her life. She was terrified of everything. She was scared to come out of this cave that she'd been imprisoned in. She'd not made art. She'd held back for so long because she was so scared about judgment and what people would think. And she she joined our community and she wouldn't even put a profile picture on because she was too scared. And now she's doing TikTok courses and she's doing, she's just unleashed all her creativity. She said she, and she's just enjoying her art making. So, and she's in her 80s. I mean, what a gift we've, I mean, I just find it so humbling that we've been able to, to provide that for someone. I, that, that's why, why I get so excited about doing all of this, because to impact someone's life in that way is just the most, it's the best gift ever on the planet. So, um, I mean, another way of looking at this, by the way, which is, a, it's quite kind of morbid, but you're, you're 69 you know, I might not get to 69, you know, it could be the end game for me next week. And so we'd, we'd never know, you know, I, I know that's kind of like a really harsh reality and I hope it's not triggering for anyone, but it really is our life. We just don't know. So age is, is kind of irrelevant when you think of it in that way. Uh, we're here right now and that's the gift that we have. And so we, um, Good. just just do it just do it that's what I would say just do it Betty just do it um um because yeah just because <laughs> um and then on the um on the case of, of so yeah so then so here we've got then this conflicting thing so I want to use all the mediums and I want to be creative but I need to make money so this is another thing that people get really stuck in and I can see it derailing. So one of the, the best pieces of advice I can give you is not to make your art all about making a living and, and making money because if it is just about that, it will take away the enjoyment. It will take away your connection to your art making. Your art making has to come from here and it has to be born from your passion and excitement for doing it. You can totally make a living from it, but don't make the art to make a living. Does that make sense? Because 
when you make art from that place of passion and excitement and really understanding why you're making it, that's where people connect with art and with you as an artist. And I've done it in the past myself where I've been really desperate for funds. I've been really desperate to sell because I've got a family and we were just about to, you know, we we're on the verge of losing our home. And, um, and I remember selling from that place of desperation and I was trying to force to sell something because I was so desperate and it wasn't good. It, it didn't feel good. It didn't land well. And what I had to do was go back to selling from a place of passion and, and selling this because I feel passionate about my work. <laughs> So what I would say is if, if you're in this, this stage of you're being held back, I would take the, the money part of it away for now and really connect again with who you are as an artist and get excited about that because that's when the money will come. And in the meantime, as hard as it is, and I've been in this situation, it's about making money in different ways, but keeping that part of you alive. I've ha I had to do this to get United Arts Space off the ground. I had to hustle. I had to do other things whilst I worked on finding my passion and my voice and my dream. Um, and it's, yeah, it's tough, uh, but it can be done. It can be done. Um, but it's to, to sell, you need to get connected in here first. Um, let me, let me, I think, I think that was all the questions, which is good because I've just come up to the end. Um, if there are any questions that I haven't answered, I'll come back to the comments. <laughs> It says, someone always has a great question late like, on, keep Michelle online. <laughs> now is your moment. <laughs> um, oh, I love this. Simone says, I'm turning 60 this year. Yeah, what a great year. And my art is really exciting. Love getting older. It means I have less <laughs> to give. Oh, I love that. Um. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. So I'm just going to quickly scan. I'm going to quickly scan. I will, I will come back to the comments and check. But just before I go, I'd like to just check in. Um, oh, Cordelia, nice to see you here. Um, I always wish I'd be gone before 50. So Michelle, you're not morbid at all. I just wanted to skip the not being able to do anything. But now I'm almost 50. It's like I don't, I don't even feel old. Oh, Good for you. Um, so a quick one here. <laughs> um, people seem to like my art that I am less passionate about. So this, I, I just want to touch on this before I go. I've got two minutes to kind of get this out really fast. So I'll talk quickly. <laughs> um, so when you say people, and this is something to be really careful of, because this can derail us as well. So I'm just going to make this, this up now. So say I put some art out and it's all faces. Um, and it's not what I want to do. And people are like, oh my God, these are amazing. These are amazing. But when I put my florals out there, they don't get anything. And I'm like, oh. So this is the danger. Because then people start to go, oh, I should do more faces. I should do more faces. But what you've got to really be careful of is who are those people? <laughs> because you're viewing the world through a very, very, very narrow lens. It might just be a few family members. It might just be a hundred people on social media that aren't actually connected to your artwork. It doesn't mean that your people aren't out there. It means that you just haven't got the right people in front of you right now. So, you know, for me, with the faces and, and the florals, if, if the florals is what I was really passionate about, I would stop putting the faces out for a while, just hammer the florals, and I'd start to find those people who love the florals. Um, so I share this because you've got to be really careful that you're not making decisions based on what other people are liking and, sh and, and also telling you. Tracy will share this. Tracy said, I keep being told all the time that you should paint landscapes. You should paint landscapes because her, her landscapes are beautiful. And they are. They are phenomenal. 
but they're not lighting her up. She doesn't enjoy them. She enjoys the the fun caricature, um, you know, the illustrative, humorous stuff. That's what gets her really excited. And now she's owning that and she's loving it and she's not selling yet. She will start selling, but she's really tapping into that part of herself because other people's opinions are just that. Um, you've got to be careful not to view the whole world based on a few people's opinions. Even if you put your artwork, let's say, into a gallery and the gallery says, this isn't ever going to sell. Oh, I've gone over. I'm going to have to just go over for one more minute because I've got to get my point across. <laughs> there was an artist. Who was it? Oh, my. Who was it? I can't remember who it was. <clears throat> I can't remember, so I'll just have to make it up. There's an artist who I, I usually refer to her quite a lot, so her name has completely gone out of my head. But she was told for years by galleries, your art is crap. It's never going to sell. It's not commercial. It's never going to work. And she said for it was like 15 years, I think, of going to galleries, being rejected and rejected and rejected and told time and time again the same thing. Your work is not commercial. Your work is not never going to sell. She had it drummed into her, but she didn't change and she kept going. And eventually she created her own art world and she did that on social media. And now she's one of the hottest artists and I can't remember her name and I'll come back once I remember. Her, her art is controversial. It is, it is She's taken a pop at pop culture and her art is not everyone's cup of tea. She gets a lot of stick for the art she makes, but she also has hit her, she's found her people now and she's selling for like 30,000. Her pieces are selling for tens of thousands. And now all the galleries want her <laughs> because she's become known. So be careful of other people's opinions. Just because that gallery said that doesn't mean that there isn't a pocket of people that don't, don't see something in your work. It doesn't mean the whole world is going to see your art in that way. So just because 20 people or 100 people liked a certain artwork doesn't mean there isn't a pocket of people in the rest of the world that isn't going to like that work. Just because a panel of people who were judging you in a competition said your art wasn't good enough doesn't mean that the whole world will think that way. So again, you've got to do it from here. It has to come from you. You've got to do the work that is, makes you passionate. Otherwise, what is the point? What is the point? Because you'll end up making art that's just blah. Um, so that's it. I'm going to zip it, lock it, put it in my pocket, as my kids always tell me to do. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. So um, if you'd like to join us in the virtual art studio, the link is above. Um, you can go and check that out. We close enrollment tomorrow and I'm back tomorrow. So I'm just thinking what's coming next. So tomorrow is the last live, which is kind of the, the finale of Your Art Matters week, just recapping everything that happened last week. I'll announce the final competition winners and I'll do some last minute Q and A's in tomorrow's live as well. So that's at the same time tomorrow. I'll be back. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for joining me. Everyone take care and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.